Hello and welcome to Tech Point Zero, the show about technology, people and politics with Chris and Ben. You're listening to episode 12, released in April 2022. My name is Ben and as ever I'm joined by Chris. In this episode we'll be having a chat about home labs in 2022. Let's get to it. So um, I've had a home lab for a number of years now. Um, for anybody who's uh, uninitiated, um, a home lab is maybe a more full-on home server. You probably have uh, a, a NAS, maybe a VM server, um, certainly uh, probably a firewall, a software like a software firewall like uh, PFSense. My home lab is starting to get to the limits of its scale, and I'm starting to need a little bit more software uh, and maintain it <laughs> in a better fashion than I have been, shall we say. Um, and I just thought it was an interesting point in time, um, if you've seen what's been happening lately with TrueNAS, particularly, uh, to discuss where I could go next and what the different options are. And I probably wanted your advice on it, Ben, as well. This episode was sort of initiated by uh, by, by Chris saying that he had some questions um, around about uh, sort of the newer releases of TrueNAS. Um, and that we could either have a chat about it together or we could have a chat about it with all of you. So, yeah, I think this is, um, yeah, the better way of doing it. <laughs> um, so, I don't know how much you follow Trinas, but they have created a sort of uh, second version that is going to run in parallel to the main version. So they've got uh, Trinas Core, which is staying on FreeBSD, and is sort of continuing the path that they've previously that they've been going on with that anyway and they've now got Trina scale which is based on debian on linux and then that is enabling uh, more uh, technologies in it sort of uh, kubernetes and docker yeah basically um if we look at a lot of the other uh, nas providers i'm thinking specifically someone like synology but my guess is is that uh, ReadyNAS and, and a few other providers are, are, are doing the same. Whereas uh, five to ten years ago, it was relatively easy to give you a fairly simple, low-powered system that would just do network-attached storage. Yeah. With computing as what it is now, um, you can have a machine that is very capable of doing that network-attached storage, but... There's so much more potential for that. There's so much more capacity there in terms of computing. So you could run a web server on it. You could do email yep. on it. But you could also do video encoding on it. Um, you could do um, a small game server on there. Um, there. There's a lot. There are more workloads that you can do on a on a NAS today than you could do on the NASs of uh, on the sort of uh, home NASs of ten years yeah. ago. And I think one of the advantages of building yourself is definitely that side of it. I think when you get more uh, more of the integrated solutions, they they do allow you to run those sorts of um, applications, but uh, you can tune the performance for your for your needs when you're building something yourself. Admittedly, a lot of my hardware is secondhand. Um, normally, my old gaming PC gets <laughs> repurposed as the NAS. I suppose the choice I have coming up, there's, there's two options as far as I can see, is I can switch my NAS to TrueNAS Scale and use its management interface to run um, Docker applications. I've had a bit of a try with that, a bit of a go with that, and I think it's it's kind of early days yet. Like I had, had some finickityness, shall we say, I, I suspect it's just like I need to get it configured right. I haven't put the right values in the right boxes, and with a little bit more um, configuration, it would work. But I definitely had some of the Docker images would start up and fail, and I was like, "Oh, what did I do wrong? I've got to go and figure out what's what's happening there." Using Docker is something I would like to be able to do because I uh, I run a significant-ish number of um, different applications on there and having to run a VM for each one independently would use up an awful lot of memory so yeah using Docker in that capacity would be good but I don't need any of the Kubernetes stuff and I'm that learning side of it I'm not um, going to be working on so um, one of the questions I 
I've got two questions, but one of the questions I, I have first is um, the kind of applications that you're running. My guess is that they are either Linux specific or um, uh, very much Linux native applications. No, well, they're, they're definitely Unix native. At the moment, they're all running in on FreeNAS core, so they're running in FreeBSD jails. Um, I run uh, Nextcloud. Um, there's a number of uh, I run a number of uh, jails that have to be behind a, a VPN as well. Uh, and I've got a configuration for that that seems to work. And then there's there is actually a virtual machine running on there as well, which runs a Ubuntu server. But again, I found it's something I've seen other people talk about. I found the free NAS and even sorry, it's no longer called free NAS, is it? I found the true NAS core and true NAS scale implementations of these things of, of VMs and. Um, Docker to be, and, or just jails and containers, to be just a little bit less fully featured than the than the other solutions. So something I've been testing out, trying out, uh, is Proxmox on uh, <laughs> a very old MacBook Pro, because again, more secondhand hardware. I might be able to get money to build a, a VM server of some sort. I was scouring ebay see if i could find any uh any cheap enterprise cpus but it turns out the motherboards are pretty expensive um and i've thought about hybrid solutions of like staying with true nas core for the nas functionality and maybe some of the jails i think it probably good for Nextcloud and like sorry i've just interrupted the entire thing by um Point of interest. Oh. This is not a uh, uh, this is not a sponsored uh, bit. But uh, when I got don't, my home don't server, tell them. Now, I, now uh, they're going to go and boost push the price up. <laughs> um, <laughs> Chris has got a choice. He can either let you push the price up, or he can uh, get get his uh, get his new server before pushing this episode up. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so uh, when I when I, I got my uh, home server, which is still not unfortunately set up yet, um, from Bargain Hardware. Um, in the UK um, in the US there is something called I think it's called Unix Surplus which are basically the same um, basically around the world there are companies that um, when their hardware gets to a point that they don't want to keep them often mm -hmm. after the three or five years when the manufacturer's warranty has run out um, they will get rid of them and there are companies around the world that will buy them clean them up refurb them if need be um, and then sell them on to you Mm, I'm already scrolling through here. <laughs> there, there are a few um, that might be within within some sort of reasonable price range. <laughs> At the lower end, definitely, but still. So, uh, a question about Pro Proxmox then. It's it's a it's a solution that I've heard a lot of. Mm -hmm. um, I believe maybe. Six years or so ago, I, I might have installed it on a desktop at work to give it a go um, yeah. to see how it compared to um, VMware's vSphere because yeah. uh, that's what we were using at the time. I remember it being, at the time, a, um, a virtual machine first distribution um, or, or, or piece of software. I don't recall it doing anything with containers. That being said, I wasn't particularly that, keen or aware at the time. That is 100% still the case. It's definitely... And I don't remember it being storage focused either. Yeah. So th this is one of the configurations I've been exploring. Um, is so Proxmox. I would I would do have a uh, with th with this configuration I would have a TrueNAS core NAS, which does have uh, better performance than TrueNAS scale. So mm -hmm. there's definitely some advantages to going with that. I might run one or two jails um, that are particularly good being close to the data, such as Nextcloud, because it's just um, it's easier to mount all the drives and just have that that data there. Um, I can then um, mount. I can then have a, another machine, another physical piece of hardware. I'm mm -hmm. not super keen on running either of these as uh, in a virtualized situation. I think that's that can get messy. Um, <laughs> The, yeah, so then I'd have another machine running Proxmox and would mount uh, uh, a 
storage from the NAS over iSCSI. Yep. Um, and then one of the solutions I've got for looking at containers is using something like uh, Portana. This is a Portana project. I've heard of it, um, yes. Which is, is relatively lightweight. Like, again, no Kubernetes. It's just a, a UI for running Docker. I had a little play around with it, and it seems to work. And then, other, again... The downside of this approach is a bit more is requires a bit more configuration. I'm I'm going to be mounting drives over probably SMB for for getting to some of the the drives that need to be shared between multiple users. I I've learned the hard way that trying to use multiple share types for the same data set is just a bad idea in every respect. Um, so yeah, it would probably yeah it would have to be SMB because of other users in the house. As an aside, doesn't Windows do NFS now? Does it? I'm pretty sure I've heard that it does. Um, I can't remember whether it's uh, whether I I've, I can't remember whether it's like there by default and it's a service that you've got to start, or whether it's sort of like a Microsoft add-on. Only, only works in Windows 10 Enterprise. I've only got ah. Pro, um, and actually uh, there are users in the house that have Home, so I would be yeah unable to do that unfortunately. Um. But it, I think it would work. Like that would be that would be fine. Um, I think the main thing is I can I can get the time to set that up. My main concern, in terms of a lot of this, is like reliability of the setup. It needs to be relatively low maintenance. So it's easy for me to get a block of time to just be like right for the next day, two days, three days, whatever. I am doing this and get it done and sorted. But it's mm. very difficult for me to, oh, I need half a day to rebuild something because it failed. So what you're looking for then is if we kind of shift towards um, more operation speakers, although you're not needing things to be um, highly available from the point of view of um, like a bank needs something to be highly available, no, for instance. No, at all. <laughs> um, you are looking for those sort of high availability um uh, features if you like um, because actually I'm just thinking if we look at things like um, duplicating everything that you've got so you've got two replicas of something mm -hmm. as, as, a, as an example mm -hmm. you could have I appreciate that it's a um, a whole second set of hardware <laughs> but for your for your virtualization piece mm -hmm. um, if you have two bits of hardware um, that can fail over to each other um, or mm -hmm. you know, to to uh, an instance of Portana, for instance, that is on two different bits of hardware yep. that both run a Docker container, and you know, um, yep. maybe you load balance somehow between them. Um, but but ultimately, so, you can lose one. It means that you can lose a whole stack. Yeah, and keep going. Yeah, so there's a, there's a cost issue there, obviously, yep. which I probably don't have, and also hardware failures aren't the the problem. Um, so the rest of the people in the house are using the services such as Nextcloud. If a piece of hardware fails, and I'm just like, I'm sorry, I've had to, you know, Amazon Prime or, or whatever, it'll be here tomorrow, I'll install it and get it sorted. That's, that's normally okay. Cool. And, and things can normally be moved around for something like literally the hardware is broken. Yes. The problem comes as if I'm fixing the configuration every, I don't know, every weekend, yeah? Yeah. And, yeah. and if it's spending three days, you know, between <laughs> before the weekend broken yeah um uh, that's something that has definitely happened with some setups it does <laughs> depend on the piece of software uh truenas cores vm even though i am using it at the moment the vm setup process i would describe as a bit janky like <laughs> i had i think i had to kill two vms before i finally got one set up right and it was just I, I suspect it was user error, but it did let me do a lot of user error in terms of like, you know, I, I, I think one time I shut it down rather uh, incorrectly. I did a, a, a halt rather than a shutdown, so I completely mm. killed the power to it, and it did not like that. And another time, I think I made a misconfiguration of the um, mounted drives, and I couldn't resolve it, so I just had to create another. I would say I've used um, uh, FreeNAS a couple of times. Um, in, in various places. I have tried the VM uh, feature with it when it was, I think, relatively new. And I found that, and this goes 
generally for for free mm. NAS. I've not tried true NAS, uh, although it's basically the same product. Yeah, yeah. Um, when I was trying free NAS, it was an awesome open source. I don't have to pay anything for it tool. Um, that could have done with a bit of polish and and actually you know what the ui was pretty polished in terms of it looked pretty or it you know mm-hmm. but actually there was some functionality functionality pieces that you click a button once and it does a thing and you click it again doesn't seem to do the same thing um you know odd little bits like that you press the button and the light doesn't turn green and you're like i don't understand why so from my perspective if you want to run a set of uh, ZFS drives and share them over the network then TrueNAS is great for that like, especially TrueNAS Core is amazing um, and the performance is good and I don't and it, and it will scale to quite significant levels I, I don't I think there's been some discussion about how well it scales at like extreme enterprise scale like you know the, the big boys was it is it Fangs um, but that's a, a ZFS issue rather than a, than a true NAS issue. But as soon as you start getting to anything else, as soon as you just, you're running j- jails or you're running VMs or their plug-in system, there's compromises. And those compromises aren't always a, a bad implementation issue. I, I don't want to, I don't want to try and, I don't want to give the impression that I feel that way. I don't, but there, there's some fiddliness to it. It suddenly goes from, oh, I, I understand ZFS, so I understand this UI and this makes sense to me, to I I thought I understood how jails work, but this is not doing what I expect a jail to do or not doing what I expect a VM to do in these circumstances. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that, yeah, that's, n- that's not the kind... <laughs> that's a, that's a, a bigger learning curve than I necessarily always have time for. Um, especially when something's just gone wrong. I think, and this is this is me talking a bit freestyle, and uh, I don't believe that either of us really has the background to back any of this up um, or d- dispute it. Um, I feel, so I'm a, a huge fan of FreeBSD, really mm-hmm. like it. It's on all of my systems here at home um, in terms of servers. Uh, I've got a server in the cloud running FreeBSD, um, it's a really nice logical system to use. Yep. Um, I think where Linux has the edge, aside from the fact that there's, um, you know, the the massive, uh, a much bigger community around it and, and all of that, is um, not necessarily through something like System D, but you have a almost a service layer in in Linux. There's a mm-hmm. because it is. Um, a bunch of components thrown together and I do often see it as just thrown together Um, they necessarily have to have a good interface between them that you can switch one thing in and put another thing sorry switch one thing out and put another thing in its place Um, with FreeBSD with it being a complete system is perhaps part of it it seems to have less of a um, no it has a far more traditional interface if you want to do stuff via shell brilliant if you want to do things by by, uh, via c even better but the moment you start kind of going hey i have this web service that needs to interact with this um low level component um it can be done but um that's not how the the system as a whole was designed yeah um and and i so i think that it breaks down a little bit and and looking at some of the i I think that true nas uses a uh, jail manager called IOHive. No, not IOHive. IOCage. Uh, IOCage. Yep. Um, it was written in shell. They picked it up. They, I think they took the lead developer on and they rewrote it in Python. Um, Python isn't shell or C. And so having looked fairly recently at the IOCage um, code, because I was looking mm-hmm. for something, um, it literally shells out and does a jail command. <laughs> so you've got a web interface and, and you're interacting with it in a way that you expect a web applica- application to um, to behave. Mm-hmm. In the background, it is firing off, it is running some Python code that in turn runs a shell command that then runs a C program and interacts with the kernel. Um, yeah. And then it, you get that back again. Well, if anything past the web interface fails, takes a bit longer than whatever, um, you're then left with your 
web application maybe being a bit where am I? So my understanding is they have made uh, improvements there as well. So they've um, uh, got a middleware um, sort of layer for that is running on both um, Trunas Core and Trunas Scale. Mm-hmm. And I, as I would imagine, and this is coming from my assumptions as a as a web application developer, not no, no knowledge of the internal code base, <laughs> but I would assume that they have some sort of state management in there where they're recording the state of the system and then running a command, checking that command worked and then changing their model of the state and then dem- and then showing that to the user. The funny thing is we've come at this from two complete angles. I know uh, the bit where you get into the Python code and, and go down, you know, the bit from the web interface to something <laughs> and neither of us know if there's something in the middle. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah it just, could just be a, there's a gap. It's fine. Um, I... Yeah, there is a third option that I don't really want to think about, um, which is is just getting rid of all of the software and and just like rolling my own, like I don't know, putting Ubuntu server on it, installing ZFS, and and setting up all command line. And I've tried some things like that, and I think that again has the problem of the learning curve for me. Uh, Sysadmin is a hobby rather than a job for me. Uh, I think the learning curve would maybe be a little bit too significant for some things. Like, I'm sure I could, again, get the server up and running, SMB shares working, ZFS working. Don't know how how easy or not the tuning is. The thing that does worry me is that uh, TrueNAS on... So TrueNAS scale is actually significantly slower than TrueNAS core. I think, depending upon the environment, it, it was down to like 30% of the speed of scale when you're doing transfers that was a beta it was on the Lawrence Systems uh, YouTube channel mm. um, if it does require that much tuning then I would be a little bit nervous going that route as well so just to jump in there a second um, I recall please don't take this as gospel because I may be misremembering but I seem to recall that when um Open ZFS hit 2.0. Mm. Um, so, actually, just a very quick recap for anyone that doesn't know. Um, some microsystems create ZFS. Oracle buys um, some microsystems. The open source community go, oh no, we could lose this awesome, amazing um, file system. A- and a few other uh, pieces mm-hmm. of, um, of of the stuff that Sun had done. Um Open ZFS was created by the Illumos folks um, uh, with the idea that people could um, inject their own improvements onto it. But it was very much um, left to projects, Linux, Mac OS, FreeBSD, to uh, do that compatibility bit to jump between the Illumos code and whatever you were building it on. Over time, the Linux people didn't contribute anything back, but they sort of kept their own code base um the other code base kind of didn't go anywhere because it was very much a illumus first um code base and everyone had to sort of do their own integration pieces uh a few years ago uh, everyone came together and was like this is stupid um we rebased onto the linux port of open zfs um all the ci now lives in one place all of the um, platform shims live in one place if you break something on FreeBSD by adding a Linux feature you're going to know and it doesn't get very far if I remember correctly OpenZFS 2.0 had a performance issue and lots of the mm-hmm. um, Linux distributions like Ubuntu picked it up and they are not especially on the LTSs they are not necessarily at liberty to upgrade you to 2.1 um, and 2.1 resolves the performance. I, I be, if I remember rightly, and I could be misremembering, whereas I've got a feeling in uh, in FreeBSD land, 13.0 shipped with OpenZFS 2.0, but FreeBSD 13.1 will be shipping with an upgraded version of OpenZFS. Okay, so that might that might be a very temporary issue as we are upgrading, and it also potentially could be something that affects depending upon what they're based off, uh, TrueNAS 13, TrueNAS Core. Yeah, 
June has core 13. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's so the performance issues might be less of an issue. That's good to know. Um, I suppose at the end, I'm still, I'm still in completely two minds about how to go. So we've got the idea that you could keep your true NAS and have a, another piece of hardware to do uh, VMs and containers. Uh, yep. You could switch to true NAS scale, scale, and then put everything on one machine. Presumably, true NAS scale would be the route to. It would be more easy. Yeah, it would be easier to put everything on one machine at that point, and then cool. Proxmox would be a, a more of a toy if I had it. Yes, and then the third option is don't go leave true NAS altogether. Yeah, um, and roll your own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they're the they're um, the three options. Can I, I offer you a fourth one that you may or may not have considered? And if, yeah, you, if you have considered it and have thrown it away, I'd like to know. Um, so there are other solutions out there. I'm going to say Zygma NAS, but I think that's, again, FreeBSD based. Um, there's NAS for free and uh, a whole bunch of other mm-hmm. um, uh, Linux NAS products out there. Yep. Um, have you looked at any of them and why did you discount them? Um, I've not looked at a tremendous number. Uh, Unraid I did look at. I got got um, discounted uh, because I don't believe it's entirely free, and I believe that's true for both monetarily and free software. Um, it does have some advantages in terms of making it much easier to add extra drives um, than uh, ZFS, which has been a problem. One I have complained to you about, Ben, many a time. Yeah, every every other one had issues. TrueNAS is well maintained generally. Mm-hmm. They've definitely had some hiccups when they first tried to do the TrueNAS scale thing. It, it, um, I can't remember what it was called now. It was a, an older release, and they uh, TrueNAS Coral Corral. Um, oh, that was um, they did a. They, uh, it wasn't the Linux shift, was it? They did a uh, a complete UI uh, change. Yeah, they've, they've they, used a lot of that UI code, but they also shifted to. I think it had a Linux base because they were using Docker. If oh no, they were still using TrueNAS, but they ran they ran a like VM a system did, level VM that then did the Docker work, um, yeah. and it, it definitely had its issues. There was um, in FreeBSD a while ago, if I remember rightly. Uh, so. FreeBSD is something called the Linuxulator, um, which allows you to run um, many Linux binaries on Free, FreeBSD. Yeah. Um, and you can have, um, I can't for the life of me what they're called now, but you can effectively have jails yep. that are Linux. But that's only Linux user land. Um, mm-hmm. So I think what they were doing is running like a Docker daemon in a jail. Um, yeah. That then had to go through a shim to be converted into like FreeBSD kernel uh, calls, uh, <laughs> and I I, th- I think it kind of half worked for a bit, but it basically Docker was moving sort of so fast that the, they couldn't Linux, keep up with the, the FreeBSD kernel was moving in different ways so fast, and yeah, I, yeah, I may be wrong again, but I, I think that it kind of got working and then broke relatively quickly. Yeah, so yeah, I so we've got these. I I think going for another NAS is going to much make the shift more complicated they're probably going to use zfs or something similar and other than i say unraid making it easier to add drives um i don't see many advantages to switching the the underlying file format yeah. um, and as far as i know it true is one of the better supported out of the ones available um if i go over like my requirements i suppose i just i yeah. want to have a home lab that i can it doesn't matter, like I say, if it takes a while to set things up. It can be a fiddly setup as long as it is reliable after the fact. Um, other than hardware, that's just a cost of. Um, that's just something you have to have to deal with, isn't it? Hardware failing. <laughs> um, but obviously, I can have backups in place for backing up the configuration, so that recovering from damaged hardware is relatively straightforward. Yep. I suppose having easy access. One thing I, I do like is having easy access to a way of installing various web apps. So that can be Docker, it can be the uh, TrueNAS core plugin system. I would say that has has its own problems as well. I, 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 keep, I, say, I keep trying everything out and everything has problems. Some are just fiddly. Uh, TrueNAS cores uh, 
the jails I've currently got set up, I've got two jails that need updates. Mm. And every time I go to update them, the jail just dies. Like, it fails. The update succeeds, but I can no longer boot the jail. Interesting. I, I've tried looking for solutions. I've tried seeing if anybody else has got similar things. I think maybe it's something relatively unique to my setup and my configuration. Um, but yeah, as a, while I don't mind complex setups, I would like them to be as I would like them to be straightforward. You know, being able to Google for the instructions on how to do it, read the instructions. As long as I'm paying attention, I can follow them, and it works. Is mm. is a nice that's that's a fun evening for me. What um, what is the rough specs of your current NAS? My current NAS has a forty seven ninety K with thirty two gigs of RAM and thirteen terabytes of mirrored storage and a couple of cheap SSDs mirrored for the boot drive. Forty seven ninety. Forty seven ninety ninety K is uh, Intel processor from two thousand fifteen ish. Okay, I'm just gonna get up um, the arc uh, diddly on it. Um, for anyone that doesn't know, um, for Intel, if you, Intel process, if you um, type in the model number and then ARC, it's mm-hmm. normally like the first one. Um, and then it's basically like the data page for uh, everything. So I can you see... Barely, you barely have to type ARC anymore. It just it just comes up. I do on DuckDuckGo. Um, oh, okay. So I can see, for instance, that it was launched in uh, Q2 of 2014 and it was discontinued uh, in mid to late 2017. Yep. Uh, based on the 22 nanometer lithography. I bought it so a it's... month before its uh, replacement came out, <laughs> like an idiot. So we've got uh, four cores running at about um, four gigahertz. Yep. Um, we'll, we'll do a turbo boost up to 4.4 gigahertz, and you've got a total of eight threads. On it, you can do these are all the things I. You've got a graphics on it, which is quite nice. Um, Advanced technology. So this is what I'm looking for. So you've got um, you've got hyper threading, yeah. um, you've got turbo boost, you've got all of your virtualization yeah. bits and bobs that you would want. It's 64 bit. Um, you have got the instruction sets that you would normally want. Okay, so this is a fairly capable processor. Yep. Yeah. Um, and so, as long as the as long as what you're wanting to do with it in terms of your VMs and your containers yep. don't um, can be contained within four cores and, and mm-hmm. eight threads. Yeah, definitely. I'm struggling I'm struggling to see what the advantage of having a secondary setup like Proxmox gives you. I, I, I understand that it's um it's another cool thing to play with and yeah, yeah, bits yeah. and bobs like that. Um, it's an extra piece of the for something that you don't want to actively maintain, yeah. as in, you know, this is something you're doing for fun and not something that you're doing um, for you know, a job after your job sort of thing. Yeah. Um, my my tendency is to overcomplicate. Um, <laughs> my philosophy is to try and simplify. <laughs> I, I can understand that. Yep. <laughs> Been there a number of times. <laughs> so there's a feeling for me that says going the true nas core plus the proxmox route yeah. although quite fun because you get to buy some new hardware and, and play with it yeah um ultimately it leaves you with a system that you've got to set up more stuff yeah um you've got to physically have more stuff potentially um, got to learn more stuff because i'd have to certainly learn proxmox on top of it yeah uh, and uh, potentially Portainer as well. Plus, uh, maybe not if it's a laptop which you sort of hinted at, but um, again, um, you're looking at potentially getting a system that is going to run VMs, multiple you know, full-stack systems mm-hmm. that could get a little warm. Um, so you've got the additional cooling sort of in the summer and yeah, yeah. stuff yeah. like that. Um, for me... Going with Truna, staying with Trunas Core and getting something extra feels like it doesn't really meet your requirements. Yep. Yeah. I, I can see. I can see where you're coming from there. Um, so that would mean going with Trunas Scale, or rolling your own, or rolling my own. Oh, that's interesting. So the rolling my own might actually be no more complicated than going with 
uh, Proxmox in a lot of ways. I think I think the complexity and the le- and the learning curve is similar. So uh, if we skip to the other to the other end of the spectrum then and do a roll your own, which yeah. um, so when I get my I, I bought um, about two years ago now. It's awful how long it's taken me to get anything done with it. I bought a um, a two U brackable server um, from an aforementioned on the show website. Um, it's got I think twelve hard drive slots in it. It's a, it's a proper server. It's a proper yeah. super micro server. Um, when I do set it up, it will be running the latest FreeBSD, and I will configure it as I wish. Um, I'm going to say via the command line. Like basically, I'm not going to have like a web management mm-hmm. UI on it. Um, what I will endeavour to do is be using something like Ansible to keep the configuration in um, uh, in source control, and then run it from there. So I thought uh, about aspects of that. Sorry, can I just touch on that briefly? I thought about absolutely. some sort yeah. of uh, automatic. Um, What's it called? Yeah, configuration management um, kind yep. of setup. And my experience of them using them mainly with Vagrant was that they are good for live working teams that are there every day. But for stuff that happens over a longer period of time, there seemed to show up a lot of slight inconsistencies. And maybe some of this was VirtualBox. Maybe some of this, because this is how long ago it was when we were using Vagrant. Yeah. Um, but you you would you you'd start up an old old script like you go to a, a project that we hadn't opened in six months because um, it was a very small project and you'd open it up and it would no longer boot and you would find out that there was some change somewhere in the full stack uh, and the script was no longer correct and you had to mm-hmm. change that. And that's not necessarily the thing I want to be doing, is like debugging Ansible scripts. Is that still the case? Have I had a unique experience? What's what's your take on that? So, um, what I think, I don't think it's a, it's a unique experience. Um, what I think going into it you need to realise is um, that it's another thing to maintain. Yeah. Um, so... I've not had it so much that I've run an Ansible script and it's just outright not run. No. Um, but I've had things do not what I expected them to do because um, Ansible has moved on. Yeah. And I've got a later version of Ansible and the module that I was using has de- been deprecated. Yeah. Um, and maybe it still works now, but I don't know how long for. So I've yep. got to maintain and, and update. Um Equally, let's imagine that you started using um, uh, Ansible on a Fedora system, mm-hmm. okay? And you did it. You started like ten years ago, um, so you were there quite happily using the Yum module to install um, install packages onto your Fedora system, and then sometime around 2016, 2018, something like that, Yum is no more. They use DNF, um, so. What you, all of your all of your Ansible is now wrong because it uses the wrong module. And yeah. sure, actually, maybe Ansible does some conversion for you. And yeah. I think uh, I think Fedora did some conversion for. But you know the kind of thing I mean that that uh, utilities get removed and, and new things get put yeah. in. Um, the benefit that I've seen to Ansible and and the other mindset thing you've got to get get into is you do not log into that server and do stuff by hand. Yes, if you want to yeah, alter no. a file, it's got to be done through Ansible. <laughs> oh, I uh, yes, I very much concur with you on that one. You don't do so, anything uh, yourself, be, and and in part that's because Ansible can only manage what you've told Ansible to manage. Yeah. Um, the thing, the biggest thing that I've seen um, as a reason to sorry, a reason to use Ansible, I've not actually seen the realized the benefit of it yet. But there are so many things that I've set up on my own server where a little bit later on down the line, um, something's gone wrong. Maybe an upgrade upgrade has broken something. or And I can't remember how things were before the upgrade. Um, or I can't remember what I did to do something. Um, yeah. And my shell history doesn't go back that far. Or 
Uh, I've set up a, a new jail and thrown the old one away. And so yes, I've lost the okay, history. So it's like the documentation actually, of it. Yeah, yeah. I've now got a document of, I issued these commands in this order, and last time it worked. It might not work this time because things have moved on, but I've got a starting point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is, is kind of similar. It's almost the equivalent of the, the UI in FreeNAS, or sorry, TrueNAS. Yeah. Um, kind of fulfills a similar function. It shows me the state of the system as I configured it, hints as to how it got there. I mean, probably even better with Ansible if you're committing to a Git repo. Um, you've you've got that history back there as well, so you can go back and have a look at it. Um, okay, that's, that's kind of tempting as well. Um, what else were you going to say about doing the the roll at your own kind of solution? The roll at the, the roll at your own solution. Um, you have to you manage everything, mm -hmm. okay. And the really cool thing with that is that if you want to suddenly switch out um, the Docker backend for a container D doc uh, backend, um, if you want to. Um, stop using KVM and start using Zen. If you want to do anything weird like that, you want to switch the kernel to something different, um, you can do that, right? That's part of your new configuration. That's part of how you set up your machine. Um, if you just want to um, place things particularly on drives, that might be a, a thing that you can do. Um, but what comes with all of that is you have to maintain all of that. Yeah, I was about to say, like, none of what you've just said is is particularly exciting to me. I enjoy getting all the parts working together, but not not the individual technologies themselves. I'm not going to be worried about the difference between virtualization hypervisors. No. Yeah? My presumption is, is that on TrueNAS, um, both scale and core, because mm. um, this is an area that I'm kind of fuzzy with, if you're creating a container and running stuff in there, yep. the UI gives you the option to be mounting um, directories into yes. that. Yes, it yes. does for both so of them. So, again, unless you're using something like um, Docker Compose, Docker Swarm, something, mm -hmm. uh, Kubernetes with definition files or, or whatever it is, yeah. Um, some of that you may be tempted to do by hand if you do a roll your own setup and then if when things come crashing down at some point because these things always do um you're left to figure out how you mounted things in again yep so it depends on based on your requirements i'm finding that i'm sitting here in the middle at true scale sorry true nas scale yeah yeah um because aside from the uh, performance issues that you've uh, read about? Or I think uh, yeah, it was a YouTube video from Lawrence Systems uh, I would, I think both Lawrence Systems and um, myself would expect them to get resolved over time I, I'm not assuming they're a bit better now at least I might do some testing, I did do some testing but it was unfortunately to, to a SSD target and the SSD target seemed fine so I don't yep. know if maybe um, it's been resolved or if that was particularly about the SSD. I suppose like, what, what are the real, if we dive into like, what the downsides of uh, doing scale are, is, mm -hmm. is it's much newer. There's some, there's some risk with that. I yep. think there's also some risk with, they've got a new plugin system with that. Um, there's very few kind of inbuilt plugins, which seem to work really well. There's... Uh, TrueNAS charts, I believe, are a repository that are running all of the other plugins and getting all the, the Docker. Um, TrueNAS charts sounds very much like they are using Helm charts. I, uh, now is this Kubernetes. is where I am learning something new. I do believe it is Kubernetes underneath the, the skin. Underneath TrueNAS it. charts. Let's have a little look at this. Uh, app versions, charts. Let's have a look at a chart. Because <laughs> I, I do this all day at work. <laughs> I, I knew you were the right person to speak Values, to. Values.yaml, templates. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So a true, a true NAS chart is a Helm chart. Okay. Cool. Um, so yeah, you, ins you which, install that repo and then you can just, start Docker's. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the sort of the the five second pitch for a Helm, a Helm chart is um, a package manager. 
yeah, a package manager for Kubernetes. Um, okay. You you know how um, uh, if you're installing software again, this is generally sort of on um, on Linux uh, or, or Unix systems. Mm-hmm. If you're installing software not in a package repository. Um, it may come with like a configure script. Yeah. And I'm possibly going back a little bit now as well, although I have seen stuff more recently do this. So it might come with a configure script and you'll be able to pass in additional flags to that configure script. Like, yep. actually, you know what? I wanted to go to use a local bin rather than u- slash bin. Yeah. Um, I want it configured with um, multi-threaded support or things like that. Yeah. Um, what Helm charts basically enable you to do is to pass in a bunch of values, uh, is what they're called, uh, a bunch of parameters, basically, um, that get fed into a templating engine to create Kubernetes objects, um, which will then run a um, a, a, a container for you. Uh, It runs a service that allows you to communicate with that container. Sorry, uh, an an ingress, sorry, that that allows you to communicate. Ingress was mentioned on the UI. This is where there's maybe a learning uh, gap that I need to, to do to really get there um, and I think by the sound of it what you're telling me is that's probably worth it because that knowledge transfers to some extent as well um, so that absolutely yeah. that is 100% a good thing for me um, I'm glad Plus, I learned that if they are just bog standard helm charts and it kind of looks like they might be yeah. um, there are tons out there right like, yeah yeah um, for instance, where the way we run Jenkins at work, um, the Jenkins controller, the the the, you know, mm-hmm. the main node, um, we we get a the, the the Helm chart from the Jenkins community. Um, yep. We change the values to say it lives at this uh, URL and um, it's got that storage available to it, and you know bits and bobs. You know, plug into this authentication um, system and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and we go a bit more complicated than this, but effectively Helm apply and it does <laughs> okay yeah so i think yeah the thing i found was the ui around that maybe maybe there was a mixture of my misunderstanding but it also wasn't as easy to configure as i was expecting i was mm. also experimenting they have a piece of functionality to put um certain containers behind a vpn okay which i was sort of experimenting with and maybe that was where the configuration was going wrong that i was having difficulty with um, that is definitely something I would need for some of the containers. I don't know how... Oh, like, what I would really like, and I've tried to get this working several times, is just being able to add the VPN as another network connection to uh, TrueNAS, e- either version, and then assign yeah. assign that network connection to um, uh, containers or jails as appropriate. That would That would seem like the most logical user interface from my perspective but I appreciate that the underlying technologies may not work quite like that uh, <laughs> I'm coming at this from very much a hobbyist perspective these systems are designed and when I say these systems I mean like Kubernetes Linux um, they're built from the they're built for and by people that are in very large generally organisations yep. or are um, building for and, that kind of environment. And promoted by those organizations because the more people learn it, the the cheaper their uh, their staff become. Of course, of course. But um, uh, Kubernetes, Docker, they were not built for you. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, they, they were built for, for huge scaled things yeah uh, maybe not docker quite so much it, it had sort of i suppose much more humble beginnings but you know that sort of you know, was, was what it was thinking and so actually um whereas what you want is probably perfectly doable everyone that has read that far down into it um would never come at it the way you are but and this would require a bit of thought on your side and probably some patience mm-hmm. with the acceptance that it could never happen. File a bug report. Like that is, if you're not able to contribute yourself in terms of code, yeah. that is a great way to contribute to an open source it's... project. Is give a good feature request. Yes. Okay. Yeah. If it's if it's not, yeah. The thing I don't know is, is it? I'm just coming at it from the wrong direction. 
or is it actually missing as as functionality yeah. Yeah. um so but that would be good to look at yeah um i think yeah you've you've reset my mind back on on to our scale i got very distracted with lots of shinies with proxbox but i might <laughs> I might honestly wait. I'll, I'll see how, yeah, how timing goes. I might wait for like the next version of Trina Scale to come out before I do the upgrade. Make sure they've had time to get all the all the kinks sorted. Um, people actually, you know, using it in their home labs or I hope potentially even real production systems before me. Mm. Um, yeah, but it's really good to know that the knowledge I'm learning is applicable in other ways. Like I think that makes the time more worthwhile rather than me just yeah. learning like a very niche part of of true as i'm actually learning about um technologies built on top of kubernetes which is cool yeah yeah no i i it, this oh there we go um so <laughs> the true NAS scale chart structure this is a general synopsis about the scale of, sorry this is a general synopsis about the structure of a scale app and or helm chart right um Oh, it does not directly reflect true true chart specific settings. So, I'm going to guess that maybe they've they've taken a slight. Um, They're probably modifying the helm charts. Maybe they might be added, putting some spe- some special source on it. But yeah. but ultimately, the more special source they put on, the more they have to maintain themselves. Yeah, yeah. And um, and actually, this so this goes back to something that I wanted to say, and it it's not fully applicable to. Um, you, but it's sort of um, some of my tenants for, for doing stuff is that if you pick an off the shelf thing mm-hmm. and try to bend it to your workload, you're going to have a bad time. Um, yeah. Or, or your workflow, sorry. Yep. Not workload, workflow. Um, I've seen it happen. I've, I've been in teams where we've bought something and because we've bought it and spent money on it, We've got to use it, but we also are not in a position to change how we work, and it is incompatible with the way we work. <laughs> yes, I um, very much agree with you on that. Uh, yeah, and and so being able to meld yourself to work with it is you're generally going to have a better time, as far as I yep. my experience goes. Um, the whole keep it simple, stupid. Um, really does apply in hardware as well and and um, and infrastructure yeah um the more custom stuff you do the more um uh, elaborate your setup the more you're opting to manage yourself um the more you just have to remember and 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 reconstruct mm-hmm. if things go bad um i don't know but in things like true nas um typically you can spit out a some kind of config file and that basically describes your system as it currently is yeah um and so while it doesn't contain your data um and all the specific vm images and and things like that um it's a good way to kind of get most of the way there if things balls up yeah yeah i can i can get back to even like switching to scale because i mean you've still got really got all the containers and vms one of my friends described it as it's like someone's going to move house for you and they do all of the house house move and redesigning and how they re- they build you a brand new house in exactly the configuration you want but they don't move the furniture and, <laughs> and i'm like yeah yeah it's kind of kind of along those lines but yeah you can just do a straight upgrade so the thing that that um which blows my mind that you can do a yeah, straight yeah, upgrade yeah. from one to the other yeah. um when when you said that initially the thing that strung, sprung to my mind is anyone that remembers um the 2005 WWDC um, will remember Steve Jobs saying that they've um, they've taken um, Mac OS Tiger um, that looks like this, and he put you know a screenshot up on the board um, running on PowerPC, and we've switched it to uh, Intel, and now it looks like this. And they did the sort of, if I remember rightly, the mosaic flip transition to basically exact well the exact same picture. Uh, because from the end user point of view, when it was all done, it was exactly the same. same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you're the engineer having to go, how on earth do I change this little endian to big endian thing that is... <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're doing the PowerPC to Intel <laughs> transition. <laughs> 
Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, linked in the show notes. You can also follow us on Twitter at tech underscore point underscore zero. We hope you join us again for the next episode. Bye.